We told Lutoswavsky's music sounds like it comes from another planet. And although being a child prodigy, it wasn't until he was in his 60s that he felt like he came into his own as a composer. I find this notion fascinating. And in this video, we're going to explore the path that he took, how he arrived at his famous mobile technique, why it came so late, and how he used it to create some of the best concert works, in my opinion, of all time. People often see his music as inhabiting different styles. And sure, if you pair certain pieces together, like the six children's songs with the cello concerto, they do look pretty different. But I don't think this is a separation of styles, but a separation of outlooks. He saw his music as falling into one of two categories. The first is music for himself, his personal development and his artistic journey. The second one is music for other people for children, for schools, music is a type of service to society. A lot of people view this second lighter group as the result of some political oppression due to socialist realism. Socialist realism was a cultural policy in Poland that came into law in 1949. It wasn't abandoned until 1956, but during that time, culture had one purpose, to glorify the Soviet state by portraying ordinary people and their daily lives. But in Lutoswavsky's words, this wasn't true. He wanted to write for children and schools and to be a service to society. So folk music was an appropriate fit. And that makes sense to me. I can't imagine singing Les Espaces du Sommet with 30 other school kids. <laughs> But then there was his other music, music for his personal development. And he saw this music as being on the same path throughout his career. And he said his later discovery, which came in a fraction of a second, was totally connected to the sound language that he'd been using all along. It's uh, totally connected with the sound language that I was using. Now, we know that personal development is an internal process. It's a guided change within that we direct ourselves through our response to the lives that we lead and the decisions that we make. A couple of years ago, I got really interested in NLP. Neurolinguistic programming is a psychological approach to achieving certain goals. It relates thoughts, patterns of behavior and language to achieving specific outcomes. Words are really important in NLP because they give us a clue as to how we're relating our internal world to the outside one or how we're describing our experience on the inside to the outside. These words are put into categories such as auditory. Does that sound good to you? Kinesthetic. I just can't get a grasp of Lutoswavsky's mobile technique or visual. I can see what you're saying, etc. So how was Lutoswavsky describing his inner world to the external one? Well, he was intensely visual. Gap between the question of finding it from this negative point of view, much uh, farther away. The text must be clearly presented. I think the big thing that changed for Lutoswaski was as a result of a glimpse into this internal world. He described his earlier music as occupying the extremities of music, namely harmony and the 12 notes organized into chords. And because of this focus, he felt like something was missing from his music. Simple, thinner textures, like one part monody, two parts, one part with accompaniment. And we can see these masses of sound earlier on in his first symphony and pieces like that. It's intensely chordal. Let's have a look. But later on in his work, we start to see something else emerging, something more temporal. A shift in focus from the chords and the harmony to meter. So the actual shape of the sound and the phrases. So these textures or masses of sound needed a firm shaking up to get these other textures that he wanted. And then in the fraction of a second came the mobiles. When he was sitting at his piano one day, he had this epiphany, a solution to the problem. By getting rid of the bar lines altogether, 
and instead putting notes and rhythms into a box played across a specified duration. These masses of sound became the lines themselves. He'd cracked it. It was a visual solution to an auditory problem. See them as objects and they become them. One part, two parts, one part with accompaniment, monody, and so on. He found a new lease of life. Starting with the epitaph for oboe and piano, he was able to compose all the pieces he wanted, and in very quick time frames. He wrote the partita for violin and piano in two months. I thought it'd be fun to try out some of these techniques using his old material before he found the aleatoric method or the mobiles, and see if we can get a Lutoswavsky version of Lutoswavsky. Here's the folk tune from the Little Sweet. I use the same technique. One, take the tune, Two, do some pitch or rhythmic process for variation. Three, put those variations and materials into a box to a specified duration. And four, outcompose it. A student of mine describes the concerto for orchestra as Lutoswavsky writing in the style of Lutoswavsky. And he's got a point. You can see the trajectory he was on from the very beginning. Starting from the little suite. to the Concerto for Orchestra. and in the absolutely out of this world, God help me, I'm gonna cry, Third Symphony.
Whilst Lutosławski was a composer who never stopped searching, he also never stopped finding. And while it seems that each piece seemed to possess elements of the others, it was this marked shift in 1979 that, to me, seems like the most realised version of himself. An insight into his mind and soul. And one that makes me very happy to be alive now, making this video for you. What happened in the 80s? It happened something very important for my <clears throat> compositional life. And I felt very strongly that it must be somewhere near me. But it's just a question of finding it. And why one day it happened in a fraction of a second. 